He fuses rock, funk, and the blues to create a sound that is uniquely his own. When he plays this instrument, it is clear that they become one to create music that is soulful, electrifying, gritty, and passionate. Industry experts refer to him as a guitar hero, and I happen to agree. In this segment of Frame, we are jamming with the one and only guitar hero, Craig Erickson. it lay it down so let's talk about the beginning okay. obviously you uh, love guitars yes and did you start there um i actually started on the trumpet huh. and then i just thought the guitar was cooler <laughs> <laughs> when i heard Jimi hendrix oh yes and you know so i decided that was the way to go as well and um, switched over when i was about 12 13 something like that and you've been rocking it out ever since. I've been trying. Doing and my best. You have some really amazing influencers and points of inspiration. The man, Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder. What was cool about Stevie is he could, you know, like the record music on my mind, he could visualize the whole song, all the arrangement and everything in his head, the lyrics and everything, and then he could play all the instruments. That fascinated me to be able to you know, do it all yourself so you're not dependent on all the other musicians. Then you can take it to the other musicians and have them interpret it their own way. Well, interesting. Do you do that a lot cool. today? Yes. Still, did you start off doing that or did you graduate to playing? Pretty much, you know, I had my little bands in, in junior high, me and my friends would get together and we'd play a little bit, but I spent more time trying to uh, Put it all together, write the songs and say, well, what, what would the drummer be doing? What would the keyboard be doing? And, uh, you know, I just found that more, uh, more uh, fulfilling, I guess. So. Oh, I, you know, I'm so fascinated about the process of coming up with an idea for a song. Do you hear tone, sounds, words? What's the first point? Um, I think, you know, it's like if you think about this August Rush movie, where the kid is walking downtown and he hears all the sounds of the city, mm -hmm. the train stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way it is. Sometimes if I'm traveling and I hear a truck going by or an airplane or something, it'll trigger something or the sound of the birds in the woods or whatever, you know, I'll be like, oh, wow, I could see how that's like music and I could bring that into a song, you know. So, yeah, I think it's kind of like that. I love it. <laughs> so you, your fusion points, do you have a preference with the funk over the blues or it's just naturally all comes together for you it's, in every song. It seems like I, you know, I like good music in all, in all styles if it's done well and with a lot of you know, creativity and passion and feel to it. But I like the term world music because world music seems to bring influences from any, any country and any style together and there's it's not so, so much of a tight rule about what you can or can't do in the music. And that's why I like, you know, C.B. Wonder, Peter Gabriel, Prince, mm -hmm. uh, people like that, that, you know, fuse music of the world. It also brings people together when they hear their favorite music. And Absolutely. So. Music is universal. It doesn't yes. matter where you are. Yes. People will feel the beat and, and get the rhythm. And yep. They don't have to speak that. the same uh, verbal language, but they speak the same musical, musical language, for sure. You travel a lot to bring your music to the people. What are some of your favorite destination points? I like the south of France because it's nice down there, <laughs> warm, great food, great scenery, you know, and, you know, and, and in Paris is nice too and, and the bigger cities, but I really like, you know, getting the, uh, to see the country and the villages and the history. You see, you know, you get it all. You get the, the flavor of the country, but you get the scenery of the nature, the mountains, and a lot of the history, you know, of the people and stuff. So. They love you over there. Some. They, some. <laughs> some do. Oh, I think it's more than some. They really love Craig over there because you have an endorsement deal with this uh, particular company. Yeah, this this company is out of Paris. This is a French French guitar company, Bougier. How does that work? Well, I actually, I was playing in Paris and I met um, the owner of the company who had seen me in... Uh, in Paris playing and he remembered me and, and so we were at this convention in LA and he said uh, 
why don't you play our, you know, try our guitars out. We'd like to have some American, uh, you know, blues rock guitars and stuff. And so it's just, they're fantastic, you know, so, so friendly and so uh, helpful with, uh, you know, marketing and promotion and good guitars. Love it. How does it feel to be called the Guitar Hero? Um, it's kind of like being a superhero because instead of flying through the sky, you know, with wings, you fly across the guitar neck, the frets. <laughs> <laughs> so, Do your thing. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully you don't crash too many times throughout the night. You know, maybe so. they'll put you in a guitar hero <laughs> maybe, video maybe series. A comic book. Like, come on, yeah, let's cartoon. think big, let's do it. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> Aren't you in the Blues Hall of Fame? Um, yes, I, I think so, something like that, yeah, because, um, but I'm not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yet, and I'm kind of, but no, I was, I was actually in the Blues Hall of Fame with a couple Iowa City folks, um, Pieta Brown was there with her, uh, Bo Ramsey, who was being inducted, oh, yes. and uh, Stephen Hayes, the drummer, and so it was pretty cool to be in there with Bo, because he's done a lot of world traveling himself, so. Very, very cool. Very nice. And I'm interested in your progression as a musician. Mm -hmm. You've produced and released several CDs. There's the latest. What's the difference between the first one and the most recent one, musically? Uh, I think, you know, I think as you go, you learn a lot about, you know, the process of making music, process of songwriting, arranging, and all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I think there's good to all different, uh, all different places in your progression. Mm -hmm. Some people enjoy the, the kind of freshness and the rawness of the you know, early stuff. There's a lot of energy there where you don't really know what you're doing. <laughs> but as you learn it, you can refine certain things and um, you know, widen your spectrum of uh, uh, musical possibilities. And, uh, you know, I think, and, and also as your journey goes on, you're telling the story of all the things that happened to you along the way as you travel and go through life and uh, the musical uh, mentors that you get to work with, you know, influence you a lot. So it's a good part of it. So, what is the work ethic of those who are accomplished over amateurs? What tips can you give people who want to do what you're doing? Well, I think you have to have a passion when there's not always an immediate reward. You've got to be very self-disciplined. You've got to be ready, uh, ready for rejection and failure along the way and you know get back up do it again and with me that might be like take 48 or <laughs> 82 or whatever sometimes first takes good you never know right but you know I think you just got to keep on trying uh, to get your music to people and keep trying to improve and uh, you know because because the goal is to share your music and your uh, your passion for music with people other people as many as possible and and hope that they they feel you know the way you felt about your hero's music when you were growing up. You hope they get that that inspiration and that uh, joy of life. They can feel it through the music, you know. Yeah. So you have to be ready to go for it. And art is so is so powerful that way. So, and it's true that not everybody gets it mm -hmm. right away. Right. So you have to stay to it. And how many people do you know are overnight overnight sensations that took ten years right. <laughs> to? And the more make you work, it. the more they the more you appreciate. The success you get if you've worked hard at it, it means more than if you just came accidentally or whatever. So, let's get down to some music. Okay. Uh, you you wrote a song. Yes, I did. This one is called "Funk for Yvette." Yay! <laughs> I'm just you know schmoozing a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I like it. <laughs> All right. But but I basically I come up with an idea. I kind of say, well, gee, I feel like writing something like a mid-tempo funk song, or I need to do something. You know, I did a couple things for some TV shows, mm -hmm. as you know. I did a, a song for Chicago Code and one for uh, Justified on on uh, cable. And uh, sometimes they say, well, we need a song that sounds sort of like this, uh -huh. along the lines of this artist, kind of fast, kind of slow. Well, this one I was thinking, you know, it'd be nice to get something that would go in some sort of action urban TV show or something like that. And so I've got, you know, I start just with like a keyboard track. Okay. Electric piano, and then I go, well, I need another keyboard. How about some kind of funky Stevie Wonder clavinet? 
and then I spring in a drum groove right here. I did this last night, by the way, all these parts. So there's a little groove going there. Mm -hmm. Filling it, filling it. Now if I wanted to do some guitar on it, yes. I can add this right here. So you make it look so easy. It's fun. <laughs> How do you know which guitar to choose? Um, sometimes, you know, it's just it's just kind of knowing what's worked before for that style, what uh -huh. tone, you know, it's like uh, different instruments, different settings on the keyboard or, or the guitar, different guitars is kind of like um, the painter's paintbrush sure. and, and the different colors. You're like, well, this looks good for a sunset or this looks good for a uh, portrait of a person you know right and this kind of lighting or something like that so I just I go for whatever brush works for the uh, the song or the moment <laughs> I like it I'm feeling that beat what would you substitute what other guitar would you um well play? let's say I wanted to do bass on this same track oh, yes. I want to add the bass here and so I'm working with Pro Tools here so it sometimes I get a little confused so that's the musical version of like Final Cut. Right. Okay, so I got a I got a sound there. Now I can go with this and see if I can play along a little bit here. imagined for this for song. the song and you can sing it because you are um you want to hear him over me. this let's <laughs> see maybe we'll just call it this is a funky groove okay makes everybody want to move or something it has that kind of feel yeah okay hear that funky groove you know so i just kind of hear something like that in my head and then maybe you come up with more you know intricate uh, there's your piano part on that okay so i come up with something like this turn it down for a minute so I'm hearing the rhythm, I'd be like, check that funky groove. Makes you wanna move. Oh yeah. Checking that funky groove. Make everybody wanna move. Well, well, well. Going down to the club. Just can't get enough. Checking that funky groove Makes you wanna move oh, Did you yeah. play that? Did you play that? I think so. No, wow. that was you. Wow. Come on, I wish. <laughs> Man. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> okay, you, you're showing me up now. No, you yeah, played okay, that. Yeah. I'm out, I'm it out of this. It was me. You saw it here. You saw it live. <laughs> it was me. I got, it. I got skills. Well, you were playing the piano, so I don't know. Oh, yes. You. Yeah, that was good. Did you hear good. that? Did that you like good. that little flavor? We can work with that. Did you record it? I did not record it because that was just the run through. We <laughs> you're, could have had you're the always, I know you're always supposed to have it on uh, just in case you come up with something brilliant and I did not 
That was that brilliant. Time. Let's redo it because that you know, good. like that chick from the Real Housewives of right. of whatever right. Atlanta, right. and she things. had that tardy for the party. Right. And she's like retired <laughs> now, and we could do the same thing. But ours, would, we have. You know, we got the skills. The, the vocal groove skills, that the makes thing. you want to move. I don't think yeah. that's too bad either. That's kind no. of catchy. That, All right, let's you know, do it. Let's play well, it back. Well, actually, the thing is, I think we got it recorded on on camera. So we can sample that, oh. put it back on Pro Tools, yes. and work with it. Okay. So we actually do have it recorded. Okay, cool. So thanks I to love the, it. the camera thanks guys to, here. Thanks to <laughs> audio and video magic. Yes. yes, wonderful. What's next? Are you going on tour for your new um, Actually, CD? yeah, the new CD, just, um, I just got the advanced copies, and I'm going to get it to radio and magazines and all that kind of stuff. And uh -huh. then I'm doing some some dates around the Midwest, you know, locally and all that. And I'm talking to, figuring out when I can go over to Europe again, maybe in the fall. I can carry bags, just so we're clear. Well, we'll need okay. a camera crew as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we can do a documentary. <laughs> but um, no, so I'm excited about promoting that. And that's quite a job just to promote it, you know, just online sure. and all the, you know, hopefully do some interviews and stuff like that. Like this interview right there, right, yeah, I guess. Right. But, um, we'll see, it's a it's, it's all PR, but um, that's really half half the project of putting out a CD is is you know marketing after it gets out and, and nowadays you know there is something with, with the iTunes and all that you don't sell as many physical copies of the CD mm -hmm. people are downloading it so where you sell most of the copies of the CD is at your live gigs because that Got way it. people want to buy it from you they want to support you and, and stuff and um, so that's the reason for live gigs you know got it go on so. the road Craig thank you so much for the track thank the name you. of it again it was uh, Funk for Yvette. Funk for Yvette. Mr. Fusion, Mr. Guitar Hero, thank you so much for inviting us into your lab and thank you. dropping your wisdom and your beats on us. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you for tuning into this Save the Frame. His love for music and his gift for creating it started out as a big secret. Fortunately for the world, his secret was let out of the bag and he's been giving us his musical genius ever since. In this segment of Frame, we are visiting with classical pianist, composer, and jazz aficionado, Dan Knight. Welcome to Frame, Dan. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks Thank you. So Thank much. you. Thanks. Welcome to my home. Literally oh. and figuratively. <laughs> we appreciate it so much. You have such an amazing story. It's so many powerful moments throughout your life. So. There's a lot to cover. Oh, well, it's most about. amazing. It just it's it's kind of it's kind of mind-boggling. Even when I look back and think of some of the things that have happened, they're just kind of not to be not to be believed. It's 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 a it's a fairy tale, it really truly is. Oh, wonderful! A wonderful one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's start with the secret. That was really impactful to me. It's like how can you have this talent and love for music and have everything be such a secret? Oh, it was. It was. It was totally a secret, and it, it was kind of like. Uh, it was the way everybody's rules just kind of like set in on my little ability, whatever. Because mm -hmm. uh, when I was a kid, everybody in my family sang. So I mean like everybody. My grandfather lived with us, my, my father's father. Mm -hmm. So my grandpa and I lived with us. My, his oldest son, my Uncle Charlie, uh -huh. um, my dad's oldest brother, lived with us also. So we had the two of those guys who were these incredible musicians, these great, huge Scots Irish old guy. So we sang every day. When I was three years old, my uncle bought me a little toy xylophone that had sharps and flats. Mm -hmm. So I started matching the pitches that I was singing. And I didn't realize it, but I had perfect pitch. So yeah. I could listen to something on Hit Parade. Now that dates me a little. But I could listen to something on Hit Parade. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, if, if how much is that dog in the window is on Hit Parade for 32 weeks in a row, you know, if you, yeah. even if you're four years old or whatever, you can still figure it out. You sure. Know? So, uh, so I would sit on my little xylophone and play. So I would just match the pitches on the xylophone. And, uh, but my family didn't have a piano. And uh, the only place I saw a piano was at church. And, and they had really stringent rules at church. At church, you, had, you could not even touch the piano. You couldn't play it. You could not even touch it if you weren't taking lessons. And uh, nobody was going to give lessons to a little four-year-old kid from the east side of Atoma back then, you know? Okay. <clears throat> so, so, uh, uh, so I had to keep this little secret to myself because I could play my little xylophone and I would walk and just kind of go along and wherever there were notes that were below the pitches on the xylophone, I would whack the floor. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and then if there were pictures of Bob, I would take my little valley and say, there were pictures of Bob. The floor. It's like, there are notes here. I know there are, but they're not in a stupid xylophone. You know? And then I would get frustrated every week because I would go to church and I would see this piano, and it was all there. Everything was there, but I couldn't touch it. 1958, right before my fifth birthday, we went on vacation to my aunt's house out in Oregon, and my aunt had a piano. Oh, so I said, heaven. Oh, there it is, there's my chance. But there again, she's like, okay, well, you can't touch the piano. So my sister, oh. my sister, yeah, well, she was, she had lots of rules. <laughs> <laughs> it's a recurring theme in Yes, it was. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. My older sister was 10 years older than me. Uh, and my cousin, who was about the same age, were, was taking piano lessons. His cousin, who was taking lessons, was trying to show some things to my sister. So she played some things that, that she had learned in her lesson. I was standing and watching, like two feet away from the piano, but with my hands behind my back. And, uh, and my sister said, well, let's play the theme from Dragnet. Can we figure that out? So they were playing, dun ba dum bum bum ba dum bum bum ba dum bum bum And I said, that's the wrong note. Um. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean? I said, that's not how it goes. Bum ba dum bum bum ba dum bum bum ba dum bum. It's supposed to go bum. And, he, and they said, but where is that? And they played it. They played all over everywhere. They were on the keyboard and they, they couldn't find the right note. So finally I said, this is how it goes. And I walked up. I stormed up to the piano. I went bum ba dum 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 ba dum dum bum ba dum bum. And then I hit da 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 da. And then. And then it was silence. It was like this big E.F. Hatton moment from the commercial, you know. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, everything just got deadly quiet. And my, my aunt looked over, and my aunt was stone-faced, and my mother was astounded, and I thought, oh my God, what's going to happen? And so my aunt looks at me, and she goes, he's a genius. <laughs> and, I looked at, and I looked at my mom, and I said, does that mean I get a spanking? <laughs> and my mother said, how many other songs can you play? And then I sat down and I showed her. I said, well, I figured out that uh, that I could play on the black notes. I could play the theme to Wagon Train. And then I sat down and I played everything that my cousin had just played that I hadn't seen before. I sat down and played back to my cousin everything that she had just played after she'd been taking lessons for three years. My mother made a call when she got home and mm -hmm. called her best friend, whose husband was a piano tuner. Mm -hmm. We bought a piano from him for $25. It was the best piano, the best upright piano that he had. There, the little old lady who was this <laughs> fantastic teacher in Ottawa uh -huh. lived just two or three doors down from our house, uh -huh. the next block. And she had taken master classes from Paderewski after World War One. He was one of the first big Steinway artists. He was like legendary. So that's how I learned. Now your compositions. The song that I have is called Afternoon in the Rain. So it Start with the story. And that's it for the segment of Frame. We've all heard great vocalists. 
but what is the secret to their distinct style and their amazing voices? In this segment of Frame, we meet with two incredible local vocalists who are going to share their tips and insight and training with us. With me is Janelle Lauer and her mother, Jane Teeny. Welcome to Frame, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. How long have you been singing, individually and together as a duo? Well, I'm obviously a bit older than she is, so I've been singing for, since I was about, oh, I don't know, 14, 15, started playing in bands at that time in the 60s, and uh, really didn't have any formal training except for some high school, but until I was an adult and started doing it professionally, and then I decided that maybe I'd better find out the real way to do this, the, way, the proper way to do this. And there is a proper way, which we'll yes. talk about. And mom got me on stage when I was three. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, in church and uh, just, she traveled all over the place singing and I would go and follow her around. And I did some high school stuff and was a music major at Iowa and uh, yeah. That's really exciting with yeah. great memories. Do you yeah. have the videos and the stills uh, no, of being on the pictures. <laughs> pictures? Oh, no, yeah. So you obviously, you relate it, mother and daughter, mm -hmm. as you indicated. There must be some natural gift here, is what I'm picking up. What do you think? I think yes. I and mean, people tell me all the time how much we sound alike. Mm -hmm. When we sing together, certainly um, we understand each other without even have to say saying or you know anything about it. We just automatically do it because we're related. Um, but we also. Uh, you know, can really read each other well and we harmonize really well. We've been doing it for a really long time and because our tone is really similar, it blends great. So that's, that's really the key to it, I think. Let's talk about harmonizing. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between harmony and melody? Well, melody is the, the first thing you hear when you hear a song, whether it's, uh, it's the, the storyline of the song and that's where the, the uh, line of the song takes you is where the melody goes. The harmony is just a great complement to the melody. Can you give us an example? Yeah. <laughs> Vocally, that is. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. So I would have the melody, and she would have the yeah. harmony. Generally, she's generally she, almost always she's below me. She always says, "Jane's in the basement." <laughs> <laughs> and what does that mean? <laughs> well, she just is likes it? to sing the low part. I have a true true low alto, so yeah. you know, I've got a very broad low range and a very small high range. <laughs> <laughs> and you? Uh, I've got a pretty wide range in general. I did soprano stuff when I was in high school, and since getting older, my range is lowered. But I also teach voice lessons, so I have to keep up on all of the how you do this and how you do that. And, but my range is pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Octaves involved uh -huh. in uh, how many? How many are there? I, I can't well, remember. I, normally a normal range is probably two-ish, and then you get you have some people that have three to four. Like Mariah ranges. Carey. Well, that's oh, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> she's a freak of nature, right? <laughs> she's a freak of nature. <laughs> I was like she's talking to the dolphins. <laughs> What's your favorite genre of music to sing? Uh, for me, probably R and B, rock and roll, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I love Same. R and B stuff too. How do you train your voice to understand what key you're singing to correspond to what a musician is playing? I, I think yeah. some of it is, is experience and some of it's natural talent. But, you know, when you sang for a while, and especially if you do a lot of harmony work, mm -hmm. you know, you just, you, like if you start with an E, you know, three steps above that is a third above, and a five is a fifth above, those are, you know, har used harmony patterns. And, and then when you're thinking about whether it's doing a run up to a note, or, mm -hmm. you know, when you're singing a song, you have to think in your head, okay, I'm planning my trip, this is where I want to <laughs> end up, and it, this all happens like this. You know, and you, you think of it and you're you know, up to the note, or you, some of that just comes with experience, but a lot of it is focus in your head. Mm -hmm. And the other part is, it, which took me a while to really understand, is you have to either, you have to memorize your lyrics, you know, because you can't perform a song if, you're, if this is you being used up with what's next, you know, mm -hmm. or what word is next. So it distracts you, from what you from just described. To, yeah, from being able to think about where the notes are and where, where you want to go with your trip in the song. Right. Yeah. Any other tips you have for vocalists on fine-tuning their craft, finding their unique style, getting out there, sharing their gift with the world? I think you just have to, you have to dive in and you have to do it. If you have a drive to 
express yourself that way, then you just have to do it. It's, it's like any other dream. I mean, who didn't want to be a rock star when they were 12? <laughs> yeah. You know, everybody did. Yeah. Some people still do. And they're, you know. 65? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But if you, if you really want to do it, just start and go. And you never know. The thing about this, the thing about music is it can take you down so many different avenues. There's no one right answer. It's, it's not like accounting where there's only one answer. You know, it's math and it's there. Right. It's, uh, there's so many different options. Well, yeah. the other thing for vocalists, too, since I am older, you know, and I've learned to respect my instrument more, the importance of warming up, you know, and having some kind of planned, again, planned system that you're going to use to warm up your voice before you try to blast and sing, sing out. You'll, you'll lose your voice, you know, you'll do damage to your chords, whatever, and I didn't understand that until probably about five years ago, and Rob taught me that, actually, mm. gave me a warm-up program, and I use it faithfully, no matter whether it's a rehearsal or a performance. And I never have a problem anymore. No more bars can't warm up. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I think of you know working out. Absolutely. It's it's, you know, it's, it's respect. Yeah. Your yeah, body. It's muscle. Yeah. 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 Well, will you two take us out with some number? Oh God. Oh. again yeah. for your time yeah. and sharing Thank your you. talent and your wisdom and you all have to check them out thanks for tuning into the segment of frame Sponsored by Allegra, Click Marketing Solutions, Dialfolio Jewelry, 